pulpit, considered earlier in this series, was forged in the heat of the Protestant Reformation. It may originally have been made for the chapel of nearby Gorhambury House. This property was home to the largest local landowners, Nicholas and Anne Bacon, and their son Francis. There is a certain irony here, because our next artefact is this memorial to Francis Bacon, a man whose novel ideas about investigative method led to him being hailed as the father of modern science. The presence of Bacon's memorial in this his parish church invites us to explore the dialogue between scientific study and religious faith. Born in 1561, Bacon was an extraordinary polymath and public figure. He began his career as a lawyer, through which he climbed the greasy pole of politics under Queen Elizabeth and James I. He rose to become Lord Chancellor of England, but fell from grace in 1621. This gave him time to pursue writing on scientific method, the subject for which he is now most famously remembered. In his book, The Nova Morganum, Bacon sought to overthrow the prevailing perception of philosophical deduction, which dated back to Aristotle. Instead, Bacon promoted inductive reasoning. By this he meant that all possible data about a subject should be gathered and then studied to see what they might reveal. He thought this offered a more objective approach. Bacon likened his new methodology to a ship sailing through the Straits of Gibraltar, leaving behind the organised classical lands of the Mediterranean and heading out onto the high seas of discovery towards the New World. Half a century later, Thomas Spratt hailed Bacon's breakthrough in this poem about a history of the Royal Society. Bacon, like Moses, led us forth at last, the barren wilderness he passed, did on the very border stand of the blessed promised land, and from the mountain top of his exalted wit saw it himself and showed us it. Bacon is wrongly attributed with saying that knowledge is power, but he believed as much. He urged the government to invest in his new scientific method as a means of boosting English influence around the world. Alas, according to legend, Bacon's natural curiosity got the better of him when he died of a cold. A cold which he had caught from an experiment to stuff a chicken with snow. A vain attempt to invent the fridge freezer. We don't know for certain whether Bacon is buried in St Michael's. But whether this statue is a tomb or a memorial, it is an extraordinary piece of sculpture. It represents a revolution against the Puritan austerity and piety which had held England in thrall since the Reformation. Here is a man in lavish clothing and relaxed posture, somebody who delighted in this life and who celebrated fun above severity. Bacon is captured in the art of thinking and as a man who set great store by his own intellect and free will. His commitment to intellectual independence is an extension of the Protestant principle that everyone should weigh Christ's claims and respond as an individual. However, the way in which Bacon exercised his intellectual freedom raised serious challenges to some beliefs and practices of the mainstream reformers. Something of this paradox is reflected in the way that later generations have tried to claim Francis Bacon as their own. They sought to rally his reputation to their contradictory causes. Thus, Bacon was cited by radicals during the time of Cromwell in their campaign to rebuild England as a godly paradise after the horrors of the Civil War. But shortly after the Cromwellian period, Baconian method was enlisted by the royalist scholars who founded the Royal Society. In another episode, we will examine a piece of political propaganda from this Restoration era and consider what it tells us about the murky relationship between church and state.